I would also like to thank the Concurrences Center for Colonial and Postcolonial Studies at Linnaeus University in uh, Vequa, uh, who've been hosting me this semester. This paper grows out of my dialogue with colleagues there um, on the concurrent crossings of archive, voice, and place. So I start with this question. How do art, literature, and popular culture reflect and shape understandings of settler colonial cities in Canada and Australia in global times. Can a comparative post-colonial perspective illuminate what is at stake in understanding the responsibilities of the artist to her art and her world, primarily in 21st century Canadian contexts, but also comparatively within the global scene? I explore these questions indirectly by first citing the central character Sheila's claim in Sheila Hedy's 2012 book titled How Should a Person Be? It's posed as if it were dialogue in a play. Sheila, I want to know what it's like to think in the desert versus what it's like to think in the city. She asks this question of a man named Solomon whom she meets in a copy shop in New York as they discuss various debates about Jewish history. But he turns away from her question and she never receives a response. One way to make sense of this puzzling book is to see it as an exploration of this question. If Sheila is the inheritor of a Jewish tradition forged in the desert wilderness, how can she be true to that tradition when it's relocated to a contemporary Canadian city. And as a woman, given the patriarchal nature of that tradition, should she be true to it at all? If from deserts the prophets come, as Australian poet A.D. Hope asserts, then who comes from the city? Can Sheila be the 21st century genius she aspires to be while living in Toronto? Sheila suspects only the great cities of the world produce the famous, and despite its desire, Toronto is not one of them. She quantifies the cities that have produced the majority of the world's greatest artists, and wonders if she should move to increase her chances of being recognized. Or is it possible Toronto might one day make the bottom of this list, perhaps through her efforts? If Jewish people are the best at knowing how a person should be, as Solomon insists, why is Sheila so bad at knowing this? As Sheila's quest to discover how she should be jumps from one non sequitur to another, her story enables readers a fresh, if often disconcerting, perspective on life in contemporary Toronto. Sheila thinks it a good sign that no one really knows what a female genius might look like or where she might thrive. That leaves more space for her. But is the city the right environment? Australian writer Tim Winton speculates that, in his words, oceans and deserts are useful settings in which humans may acquire a certain context, shall we say feeling like the insignificant speck you really are. Yet Sheila feels that way in the city. For Dion Brand in her novel, What We All Long For, published in 2005, such is the purpose served by the city, which makes you, in Brand's words, common, really, common like so many pebbles, so many specks of dirt, so many atoms of materiality. So how is it different then to think in the city if it is different at all? And how best can writing capture the essence of what it might mean for people to start thinking differently in the city? In an interview about her book, Hetty suggests it raises the question, what does art become if exile is not an option? In a global world where art circulates globally, does local space matter anymore? If desert exile once inspired Sheila's ancestors, how do the categories of value need to be changed to accommodate urban imaginaries?
So in today's talk, I'll be considering Hetty's book in comparison with two other Toronto novels, both published a little earlier in 2005. Russell Smith's Muriela Pent and Dion Brand's What We All Long For. These fictions will be set in dialogue with one Winnipeg-based long poem by a promising Cree writer, now deceased, Daniel Francis's City Treaty from 2002. I'll be asking to what extent urban-based imaginaries replace or reconfigure national narrations in these texts and examine the ways in which these urban fictions explicitly query the relation of the artist to community in the early 21st century. So mostly set in the downtown city core, these fictions follow routes often set by walkers who find walking through the city conducive to thinking, remembering, and creating. To further extend the settler colonial focus, I include a short consideration of Australian Gail Jones' Sydney novel, Five Bills, published in 2011, which in a longer paper could compare productively with Brand's novel through its characterization of the city as a global crossroads, where hope is balanced by the awareness of what Brand calls so much spillage and where lives cross in unanticipated ways. Both novels end with a major character anticipating a meeting in ignorance of a death that's already occurred that will change their future in unanticipated ways, so the novels both begin and end in process. Well, in 1986, Frederick Jameson argued that all third world texts are necessarily to be read as national allegory positing a relation between nation and narration that Homi Baba problematized and disrupted in Nation and Narration in 1990 and the location of culture in 1994. Although Jameson's concept of the national allegory attracted criticism on its first appearance, it has been rehabilitated and applied to understanding a wider range of writing from different parts of the world even as globalization, diaspora mobilities, and urbanization are changing these relations, revising subjectivity and ideas about belonging. By 1996, Manuel Castells was suggesting, and I quote, the global city is not a place, but a process. A process by which centers of production and consumption of advanced services and their ancillary local societies are connected in a global network, while simultaneously downplaying the linkages with their hinterlands on the basis of information flows. So not all cities are global cities, although Toronto and Sydney have claimed that identity. But no city is immune to global interactions. I'm interested in the way representations of these cities negotiate between their settler colonial, national, and global identities. Winnipeg, where I come from, retains its relation with its hinterlands, not just in city treaty, but also in such powerful Winnipeg fictions as Cree writer Thompson Highway's Kiss of the Fur Queen, Métis writer Beatrice Coulaton Moisonier's In Search of April Rain Tree, and Lawrence Hill's Some Great Thing. In all these fictions, it remains helpful to consider the city as a place structured by processes, those of a continuing colonization and an accelerating commodification of people, things, and their everyday relation. I choose walkers to consider these processes because of their central role in linking a particular relation to the city, that of the flaneur, to modernity, and because I wish to ask if and how that relation is changing with globalization. The view of the city in each of these texts is primarily a street-based view from the walker's perspective. Francis Brandon Jones also see homeless people on the streets. Hetty and Smith do not. Memories, personal and ancestral, shape how the city is perceived both Brand and Jones begin their novels with their characters traveling on commuter trains in the city, as if to further underline Castile's point that cities today convey mobility rather than stasis. 
Well, you probably know that Australia and Canada are among the world's most highly urbanized countries, yet myths of the wilderness and the bush continue to dominate national imaginaries, and perhaps especially often to deny indigenous people full rights to the city. Even though more than half of Canada's native population now resides in cities. This is the issue addressed in City Treaty, the long poem, through a series of dialogues between Joe T.B., a treaty buster, bush poet, with one lung left, and a native clown who follows him, of whom Joe says, you cannot shake a clown. That mask sees all. So here, TB can signify both tuberculosis, a disease that disproportionately plagues indigenous peoples, and treaty busting, an activist challenge to how Canada's identity as a treaty nation has evolved and requires revision through the writing of a new arrangement, a rethinking of the treaty relation through the city. As Francis explains in his proposal description for the creative master's thesis that became City Treaty, the published poem, the main thrust of City Treaty is that treaties are living documents that evolve along with society. Since an increasing percentage of native people are urban, their perceptions differ from those who signed the original treaties. This insight corresponds to Hetty Sheila's suspicion that thinking in the desert may differ from thinking in the city, that different time, place, locations might inspire different notions of how a person should be. This idea is explored in Joan's Five Bills through her crisscrossing movements through the minds of four immigrants to the city on a single day. So Francis argues that the treaty documents have become guidelines for the lives of those who have had to accept what their ancestors signed. Treaties, he says, are living proof of the power that words on paper have to influence lives. So this power of words to influence lives for good and bad is a major theme in Five Bills also, where Peixing's memories of the Russian novel Dr. Zivago keep her alive in Mao's prison camps during the Cultural Revolution. In City Treaty, given this power of treaties to fix words on paper, Francis invokes the example of Shakespeare's Caliban, seizing the language to making it his own. His Joe serves up a native tempest, combining intertexts from canonical English literature, advertising slogans, and pop culture, with words borrowed from the many native word drummers whose work has led the way toward writing the treaties. And here he spells write, R-I-G-H-T, to emphasize um, the need to change the treaties to match urban realities. So Francis's proposal promises, and I quote, I want to take the reader on a paper trail into the bush and the city with a storyline that I label walking in the bush narrative. The form of my long poem will be like the paths in a bush, rhizomic. So his walking marks bush-informed routes through a city whose grid has been designed elsewhere, designed in England and then imposed on the Canadian prairie landscape. For Francis, the city has been imposed on the land but remains subject to the land's imperatives. When the clown says, time for the city, Joe replies, this is where I live, the city band. Street names locate the city as Winnipeg, and what he calls muskeg metaphors reclaim the power of language from the word cannibals who have ensured the history summed up in the following formula. Treaty language, easy translate, you will lose. So that history takes new form in his question, how about a MIC treaty, TM? Would you like some lies with that? Where the trademark symbol after MIC treaty is footnoted in the text as treaty manuscript rather than trademark. And where the McDonald's question, would you like some fries with that, shapeshifts back to lies. 
So for Francis, words are both the problem and the solution. His poem retains a faith in the agency of poetry that Hetty Sheila has lost. She cannot finish her commissioned play because she cannot believe it will matter. Sheila and her friends live a bohemian and precarious lifestyle that conforms to Richard Florida's theorization of the creative class lifestyle that energizes the creative city. While nothing they do is marketable, and they despise the professionals and business people who compose most of Florida's creative class, they have also lost faith in the power of art to make a difference. So in contrast, City Treaty has been received, and I quote, as a streetwise anti-globalization manifesto for the indigenous world. Well, in this paper, I'm interested in further exploring the aesthetics of that streetwise position, which is explicated from the double perspective of Joe, the contemporary native man in the street, and the native clown, a mythic figure who traditionally questions, mocks, entertains, and turns the world inside out, as Francis explains in his thesis proposal. In the poem, however, refusing to explain is part of his strategy. The poem says, so you have to explain who is this clown, but I won't, I can not, will not, will not. Um, so by spelling not with a K, he suggests the double bind in which unequal cross-cultural explanations find themselves trapped so that the only way to express agency in this situation is through refusal. So roughly 70% of Canadians live in cities, and 90% of immigrants do. Cities in Canada, as elsewhere in the world, are caught up in competitive branding exercises designed to cope with globalizing pressures that are rendering some cities important global actors whose identities seem independent of the nations out of which they operate. Most of Hetty's text takes place in Toronto under the shadow of New York and Los Angeles. In Muriela Pent, Toronto is paired with a fictional Caribbean island seen as equally an outpost of an expiring but still potent British Empire. The city's pretensions are consistently mocked. Marcus Royston, the visiting Caribbean poet on an arts community fellowship, throws both the staid Toronto arts community and its anti-racist community organizers into disarray. He challenges Toronto notions of superiority and Caribbean inferiority. He is a cosmopolitan, they are provincial. As he flies away from the city, he wonders why no one had taken him into the countryside. Noticing vast lakes slipping away beneath him, he supposes he should have paid the landscape a little more attention, even as he finds he couldn't look at the emptiness. Toronto seems dwarfed by its enormous and almost empty hinterland. He closes his eyes and images of the country came to him. Grimy shops on street corners, parking lots, the great colonial mansions as false as painted facades in a desert. For him, the city is Canada. He concludes, no, this was not a place, not a real place. That land below was not treated by anyone as a place. Well, surprisingly, it's this observation that prompts Royston to try to write again after many decades of silence. In some ways, he is modeled on the Caribbean poet, Derek Walcott, but not in this particular way. Um, he attempts the description of a country he was seeing for the first time as it slipped away. The irony is that the aerial view of the wilderness and not the cityscapes have led this washed up romantic poet to write again. And in contrast, it's the city itself and the lives of the people in it that inspire the novel Muriel Pant. So, as you can tell, each of these are different books, but each shares an apprehension of the fragility of city lives. Francis narrator Joe claims, we all walk edges uncertain on borders slippery, between invisible borders stronger than barbed wire, cement our paths to our edge walking ways. Pei Xing's thoughts in Five Bills muse, Flesh was always melting away, 
time was always turning an undertow, the history of peoples and the slow dragging under. Brand's characters think they're safe, but they know they're not. Each neighborhood of Brand's Toronto sits, as she says, on Ojibwe land, but hardly any of them know it or care because that genealogy is willfully untraceable except in the name of the city itself. Hetty's characters prove that assertion true. None of them are interested in Toronto's character as a settler colonial city, only its potential as an aspirational global city in a present haunted for Sheila by centuries of Jewish history but oblivious to the history of her immediate place. Smith's satire in Muriela Pink cuts in many directions. His younger characters, Julia and Brian, have studied post-colonial literature at university, but they fail to link that reading to their own location. Muriela's wealthy neighbors collect Plains Indian furniture and handicrafts as collectibles. The Toronto Arts Council Action Committee is concerned about appropriation of voice and anxious not to repeat an episode in which they mistakenly supported a non-native writer who wrote native fables, offending a lot of native people by making it his thing. So in this setting, it seems that no one cares anymore about the transformative power of art. So in contrast to Hetty and Smith, each of Joan's four characters, while also obsessed with what they term the here, now, see the moment as infused with memories of the past they have carried with them to Sydney on the one day in which the novel unfolds. Jones's earlier novel, Sorry, renders her acute awareness of Australia's settler colonial identity and the sanctioned ignorance that enables Australians to ignore it. But in Five Bills, her acknowledgement of that heritage is inscribed more indirectly. The didgeridoo that each character hears as they walk through Circular Quay is not simply metonymic of Aboriginal presence at the business and touristic center of the country, but also a kind of structuring device for the novel's meditation on presence, memory, and forgetting. Catherine, a visitor from Ireland, watching the man play the didgeridoo, wondered, in the novel's words, how authentic this performance might be, and whether they were listening to music that was wrenched from a community somewhere, and a dark night, a long history, and a secret, sacred purpose. Later, Catherine is humbled in wonder at the power of the Aboriginal women's paintings she sees in the Museum of Modern Art. Ellie from Western Australia also finds her thinking prompted by the didgeridoo. But Ellie remembers Australia's 1988 bicentennial commemorations of the arrival of the first fleet. And here are Ellie's thoughts. A group of ethnically mixed teenagers were chosen as natives. It was their role to welcome the arriving colonizers, to bow, to remain silent, to be ceremonial, Obsequious. Her friend James had informed her about the Aboriginal reaction to such events. According to James, they called Australia Day Invasion Day, and the year itself one of mourning. Illy was embarrassed, in her words, never to have considered race politics or the British bloody empire, never to have imagined her nation as an entity once hypothetical and tenuous. In his own wanderings around Circular Quay, James comes to a native garden marked with a placard that acknowledges that the land was first possessed by the Cadigal people. Yet the gesture seems token. Joan's attention to the unease of settler immigrant belonging is also signaled through her revisions of the iconic Australian story of the lost child, which Peter Pierce has analyzed as conveying a foundational settler guilt. This is one of the canonical paintings uh, by Frederick McCubbin. In five, childs, how, in five Bills, however, the ch child disappears in the heart of the city, not in the bush. By transferring settler anxiety from the bush to the city, Jones marks a fundamental shift in Australian relations to space and community. Each of her characters crosses paths with the child in the train station, 
but it's only that evening that some of them realize the significance of the event while watching the television news. James DeMillo has come to Sydney, haunted by the earlier death of another lost child, a schoolgirl who has drowned on an excursion to the sea he had led as a teacher a few months earlier. Unable to forgive himself for his failure to prevent the accident, he slips to his own death from the ferry in Sydney Harbour that evening. So Kenneth Slesser's elegy, Five Bills, the poem that gives Jones her title and one of her epigraphs, was written to commemorate his own drowned friend. Critically, Dale asks of James' suicide, is it also the suicide of white authority? And she answers her question, yes and no. James was christened Gennaro by his Italian immigrant parents and renamed James at school to accommodate Anglo-ethnocentrism. If there is an openness to post-colonial allegory here, it remains a small part of James' story and only one strand in a more complex pattern of contrapuntal stories. David Callahan suggests that the trajectories of the main characters in Five Bills are not so much interwoven as presented for the reader to deal with the characters' differing processing of their lives. So there are strands of influence that crisscross those lives. Pasternak's Dr. Zavaga, the translator's vocation, the desire to leave home and travel elsewhere. Yet each person in the novel processes these differently. So each title under discussion here voices an area of concern. Hetty's is a question. Brand's is a claim, but an elusive and possibly an illusory one. Five Bills, in its citation of the elegy, voices a particular relation of place to memory and loss. City Treaty relocates the treaty from imperial, colonial, and international relations to the city but the city revisioned on a continental scale within a global capitalist circuit. Muriela Pent uses the tension between a woman's first given name, Muriela, and her married name, Pent, to note subtle class and ethnic differences and to reclaim the human scale of the building's Roman. So different as they are, each text downplays a nation-state context for their stories, bypassing that level to engage the local and the global directly. Hetty Sheila operates within a downtown urban imaginary dominated by art galleries, coffee shops, restaurants, and parties. She is obsessed by identity questions, but Canadian national identity does not figure within these. Smith's younger character, Julia, works on the fringes of that small gallery world, and Muriela, recently widowed, wealthy, and middle-aged, lives in its middle-class equivalent. Both are figuring out who they might be now that Julia has left home and Muriela is on her own. These worlds collide in Smith's famous party scenes. Brand's young protagonists, and what we all long for, were born in the city and they believe they belong to Toronto. The city is theirs, but they believe this in defiance of both their schools and their local media's views, who see them still as outsiders. The novel never mentions Canada. It has been praised as one of the first to celebrate a second immigrant generation, capturing the new cosmopolitan Toronto of the early 21st century, which had been celebrated by Pico Eyer in the concluding chapter of his book, The Global Soul. In contrast to Eyre's utopic assessment, characters in the Toronto novels each feel themselves outsiders, neglected by the cultural arbitrators who control the city and its official cultural life. So these texts are part of the new urban fiction that's challenging older views of Canadian literature. Smith's Muriela Pent includes a satirical portrait of a Canadianist, a Canadian literary scholar from the prairies who deplores this turn to urban imaginaries. And he deplores especially, in his words, the Toronto centrism that's just so commercial and so dominates the publishing world. 
Smith shows the outdated and unimaginative reading strategies of this comic caricature of a literature professor who reads only to find subversion, reappropriation, and the transgressive. And he finds these only in the earlier Canadian settler literature of earlier times, while taking no interest in the literature of his immediate time and place, or in the life of the woman who gives the novel its name. Uh, so this man, who appears at the end of the novel, is the safe choice of an arts awards committee and city establishment that has been thrown into disarray by the hard-drinking, sexually adventurous, and truth-speaking Caribbean poet Marcus Royston, who occupied the earlier position and who the city was appalled to find they'd appointed to this position. So, as predicted within the novel itself, Muriel Pent has not found much favor with the Canadian literature establishment. It has yet to generate any sustained academic critical response, a fact deplored by fellow writer Andrea Alexis, who believes the novel to be the best novel of Toronto written by a contemporary of mine. Kind of mixed praise, but nonetheless praise. Um, describing the novel, and correctly I think, as squirm-inducing, partisan, amusing, complex, and original, Alexis concludes that he almost understands why it won no major book award. He notes, it's such an acid portrait of Toronto, it's difficult to know just how to deal with the book or where to put it. According to him, it does not fit with canonical portraits of Toronto, written by writers you may have heard of, Margaret Atwood, and Michaels, Michael Indachi, or Robertson Davies. The kinds of discomfort this book arouses also fit poorly with images of Canadian national identity as successfully, if imperfectly, multicultural. In contrast, for all its own critique of white privilege, Brand's novel presents an image of Toronto that academics, myself included, find more comfortable to address. Brand's novel has attracted a flood of academic research and mostly positive critical appraisal since its first appearance. Since both novels situate Toronto within post-colonial contexts, skewering the hypocrisies of Toronto's dominant Anglo culture and valorizing serious artistic creation, this imbalance in critical reception is striking. I think the difference in reception may be at least partly ascribed to how each writer positions Toronto. For Smith, it remains an outpost of empire, small-minded, derivative, and pretentious, with little capacity for true creativity. Whereas for Brand, it's a vibrant global city, a crossroads out of which vital new forms of creativity might emerge. And Brand's narration makes it easy for her readers to condemn racism, sexism, and homophobia when they appear, where Smith deliberately creates situations meant to increase his readers' discomfort. For all that, his is a very funny book, whereas hers is not. Um, and if the funny is where great art lies, as Sheila and Margot in Hetty's novel suggest, then I'm wondering what's going on here. Are we Canadian literary critics as humorless as Smith's novel suggests? Um, of course, satire fails if it seeks to please. And Smith makes many serious points through his exaggerations. His critique of the remodeling of Toronto's libraries as places to promote community rather than reading is an important intervention modeled on urbanist Jane Jacobs' comments in a similar situation in Toronto in 2000. Yet his text's insistence that art as an autonomous sphere will fail if it yields to political demands for a clearly anti-racist or anti-misogynist stance does oversimplify the relations between art and politics that Brand negotiates with more subtlety. Well, as I've said, Brand and Hetty portray lives in two of the hipster bubbles of downtown Toronto's artist aspirants who make the city seem appealing to the affluent classes who may consume their art and live vicariously through watching their lifestyles. Either in envy or annoyance, it doesn't matter. The life is the art more than any object produced. Their angles into this world, however, are different. Brand shows the complicated lives of two generations of immigrants to the city, moving between the core and the suburbs seeking a better life 
Her novel raises questions about the implications of its title, what is it we all truly desire? Her story depicts overlapping communities coexisting and sometimes clashing as they go about their lives within a novel with a clear plot line and fully realized characters. In contrast, Hetty's book initially seems more monocultural, chick lit for the literati. In the matter of its telling, the discontinuous narrative has been compared to reality TV and to the popular sitcom The Girls, whose creator, Lena Dunham, is actually a fan of the book. How Sheila can afford her union analyst, frequent travel and regular eating out on her pay for irregular stints washing hair in a beauty salon is never explained. The book aims not for realism, but for a reality effect. It incorporates scraps of emails and dialogue Sheila has recorded of her conversations, mostly with her best friend Margot. And Sheila's fluid identity is mirrored in the bat is, is mirrored in the publication history of the book itself. It was first published in one version in Canada in 2010, then in a different version in the United States, and then again in a tighter version in the United Kingdom. So I'm working with the most recent version. But my point here is that um, while Sheila, within the book, is a work in progress, the book itself is also a work in progress. Um, so both Brand and Hetty center their fictions on visual artists and on their circle. But beyond this similarity, there are more ways to describe the focus of Hetty's How Should a Person Be? Two non-events structure the plot. Sheila's continued failure to complete a play commissioned for her to write by a feminist theater group and an ugly painting competition between Sheila's painter friends, Sholem and Margot. The structuring focus of what we all long for is also double. The story of the search for Tu Yen's lost brother, Q, left behind in a refugee camp as the family fled to Canada, and Tu Yen's construction of a giant Lubeo, an installation inviting the audience to post messages to the city on a giant pole. So while Tu Yen's communally oriented art is generally praised by critics who write about the book, it, it's interesting to note that within the book, her friend Jackie's immediate response to her description of the project is to make snoring sounds and to leave for the store where commerce of a different kind takes place. I think each of these writers addresses the marginalization of their kind of not-for-profit art in their worlds. So although Hetty's Margot scorns rich art collectors for their crassness, she also recognizes, and this is a quotation, visually, I think I always understood that looking at a Pollock painting or looking at a brick wall, like the brick wall might be more interesting for me. Uh, and her answer to this dilemma is to claim, I'm interested in meaning, not painting. Ugly, beautiful, I don't even understand what those words mean. And that claim is also Hedy's. Uh, values that seem clear in the desert can be problematized in the city. So how should a person be his excited and frustrated readers with its disruption of conventional novelistic form? Is it a novel or an anti-novel, a play or a play that wants to be something else, perhaps a self-help book, or an inquiry into the classic religious questions updated for an urban hipster's life where surfaces reign? Speculating about thinking in the desert got Salman Rushdie into a lot of trouble when he published the Satanic Verses, and the world has only become a less tolerant place since then. Hetty's character, Sheila, consistently parallels her quest to that of the Jewish people for a homeland and a route out of their enslavement in Egypt and the desert of their exile. But its manner is both much less faithful and less reverent than A.M. Klein's post-war masterpiece, The Second Scroll, which literally rewrites the first. Hetty's book has more in common with the female picaresque and finds its value in the questions it asks. Hetty's prologue establishes Sheila's flippant and funny voice as she asks, how should a person be? For years I asked it of everyone I met. I was always watching to see what they were going to do in any situation so I could do it too. 
She notes, my ancestors took what they had, which was nothing, and left their routines as slaves in Egypt to follow Moses into the promised land. For 40 years, they wandered through sand. Her narration then leaps from comically recounting how they invented matzos and bagels during this sojourn to the claim, for so many years, I have written soul like this, sold. I make no other consistent typo. A girl I met in France once said, cheer up, maybe it doesn't actually mean you've sold your soul. I was staring unhappily into my beer, but rather that you never had a soul to sell. Uh, the soul-soul dilemma raises questions about the commodification of everyday life under late capitalism. It indicates the persistent anxiety that haunts Eddie's text about life's purpose, the value of art, and the low-level guilt that comes with knowing you've won the life lottery to be born in the first world and yet seem to be failing either to remediate or capitalize on that advantage. In the transcribed dinner party conversation titled, The White Men Go to Africa, white male privilege and entitlement is savagely satirized. Here, it's no longer a question of Spivak's formula, white men saving brown women from brown men. Now, it's white men saving their own careers by documenting the lives of black women and using the resilience of black women to berate white women for their privilege. Uh, listening to the men, Margot notes, all the white men I know are going to Africa. They want to tell the story of African women. And while she believes that girls aren't as good at being boring, she also suggests that the goal of communicating something of greater importance to North Americans than the poverty of my soul may be elusive for those of us born in North America. So for Sheila, as for the inhabitants of Brand's Toronto, the only certainty seems to be what Brand calls the certainty of misapprehension. For Brand's Q, Toronto is a dangerous city because you could be anybody here. In contrast, Hetty Sheila wants to be somebody, famous, but without that changing anything. She continues, no one has to know what I think, for I don't really think anything at all. And no one has to know the details of my life, for there are no good details to know. It's the quality of fame one is after, without any of its qualities. So after everybody's 15 minutes of fame, this emptying out of meaning in favor of a world of surfaces seems alluring to Sheila, who suffers phases of seeking oblivion in drugs, alcohol, and sex, but always returns to that nagging question of the soul. Sheila's long conversation with Solomon in New York is set up like a play within a play. They discuss the nature of Jewish identity and how it is transmitted, the absence of an Israeli constitution, and by what principles Israelis live in that absence, when Solomon suddenly insists they know better than anybody else how to live. Eventually, Sheila leaves the coffee shop frustrated and upset, thinking he was just another man who wanted to teach me something. And this is a recurrent phrase throughout the book. Uh, but before she leaves, he asks her, you know what my favorite subject is? She answers, Israel. And ironically, at this point in the text, Israel is Sheila's favorite subject too. But the object of her attention is not the country, but her sadistic and manipulative lover, whose name is also Israel. Now, many of the characters in Hetty's text share names with her actual friends in real life. Sheila's fictional character, but Sheila is also the author. Margot, Sholem, most of the names are her real life friends. Israel is the only exception. So in a book where Sheila is obsessed with her Jewish identity, I think this naming of this particular lover, Israel, is, is very interesting, and I haven't quite figured it out yet. In a disturbing chapter called, What is Empathy? Sheila links her desire to sexually please Israel to her memory of one of Eli Langer's notorious paintings of child abuse and her own difficulty in untangling how you imagined other people wanted you to behave from how you wanted to behave. 
I don't know if you've heard of Eli Langer. Um, he was um, actually prosecuted in Toronto for paintings of young children that were seen as sexually abusive, not just um, provocative. Uh, and so this is an example of the later work he's, he's done as he's, he's moved away from, from the work that outraged uh, the community. So Sheila asks, did I want to write this letter to Israel because I wanted to? Did I want to lead the people out of bondage because it was a desire I had absorbed from the world or my own religious history? Throughout the text, she compares her destiny to that of Moses, but eventually begins to think she was born to be a follower rather than a leader. She notes, it took 40 years for the Israelites to get from Egypt to the banks of the Jordan, a journey that should have taken days. It was no accident. That generation had to die. They could not enter the promised land. A generation born into slavery is not ready for the responsibilities of freedom. So is she making an analogy to the situation of women here? It's hard to understand her subservience to Israel. Balancing that sense of her unworthiness is the hope she gains when things start going better in her friendship with Margot. And then she thinks, had anyone suggested at the time that it would not be the Egypt of the pharaohs that would survive and change the moral landscape of the world, but instead a group of Hebrew slaves? It would have seemed the ultimate absurdity. And it's at that moment um, that she gains a new confidence, uh, finally moves away from her dependence on Israel in a chapter she titles, Destiny is the Smashing of the Idols. However, by Act 5, she's comparing herself to the Creator. The six days of creation each have their own morning and evening, thereby showing their beginning and end. Only the seventh day has neither morning nor evening. It stands outside of creation, belonging to the divine order alone. I wanted a day without morning or evening. I wanted a day of rest. End of quote. So the book concludes with the ugly painting competition ending in a draw, supposedly to be resolved by a squash game between two competitors. But no one keeps score, and the watchers conclude that the players don't even know the rules. They're just slamming the ball around. The allegorical parallel Sheila draws between the story of her ancestors and her own life breaks down here. A book structured as a mock epic quest for how a person should be ends with the realization that the rules of the game can be ignored. A religious person might say that Sheila <laughs> learns to forgive herself. A postmodernist might find in this image of play for its own sake a model for how to live in the moment, a lesson Sheila's learned at last. Through her silence about Canada and her irreverent use of Israel, Hetty explodes national allegory as a genre of explanation. So paths through the cities I discuss here are gendered in interesting ways, and I'll skip a paragraph that, that talks about that. Uh, to move into my conclusion, I began with the question of what it means to think in the city and have discussed these texts as various examples of how some cities are being thought today. Each of these fictions thinks the city through earlier representations, primarily literary but also musical and visual, and most of the characters are members of the creative class. Even City Treaties' Joe is a poet and the clown a performer. Joan's characters are teachers, translators, journalists, and students. Each of these characters contests commodification and resists the judgment of established cultural mediators. Hedy's is the odd text out in that she's the only writer who ignores her city's specifically colonial context. Yet for each text, current global contexts are more urgent. This is true even for city treaty in which corporate capitalism has taken over from earlier colonialisms. So in other words, while postcolonial critique remains relevant, these texts invite a broader range of critical responses. Urban and global imaginaries have replaced national imaginaries in the presentation of these cityscapes. Immigrants carry a national identity with them to Toronto and Sydney, but once in the new city, they adopt the city's identity rather than that of the country of which it's a part. And I think this is true even of five bills. 
although the emerging Australian critical consensus is a bit different. Robert Dixon suggests that five bills is both explicitly Australian and insistently cosmopolitan. But I think that conclusion only works if Sydney can stand in for the nation. Uh, Sydney would like to think it can, but I don't think it can. So I argue it cannot. And together, these Canadian and Australian texts mark a transition from national to urban imaginaries that challenges some of the methodologies in which literary critics continue to be trained. And I'm thinking here of Ulrich Beck's notion of methodological nationalism, for example. Um, if I were a policy analyst, I might conclude with some prescriptions for organizing city space, but as a literary critic, I'm interested in the challenges these texts pose to conventional assumptions about how space, identity, and values map onto each other as communities renegotiate belonging and obligations in particular locations in our contemporary times. So thank you for listening and I really